Dear students, welcome back. In this video, I am going to share with you a wonderful story from your textbook in English, class 11th, Hornbill. We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. Chapter 2. This story is about a unique family that decided to undertake a very risky task together. Though the task was risky, but because of the unity of the family, uh, the family members were able to come out of the extreme risk. The narrator of this story wanted to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. He took his family also to this adventurous journey and faced extreme difficult situations and also the risk of life. But with the support of the family members and also with the help of the crew members, they were able to come out of that very difficult situation and they were able to save their lives. Now, dear students, I request all of you to please watch this complete video till the end. Now, let's start our story. The narrator started his round-the-world voyage in July 1976. His wife, Mary, his six-year-old son, Jonathan, and his seven-year-old daughter, Suzanne, also decided to go with him to this adventurous journey. The narrator was then a 37-year-old businessman. He wanted to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. For about 16 years, both the husband and the wife had been dreaming of what the famous explorer had done. They spent all their leisure time improving uh, their seafaring skills in British waters. They made a huge 23 meters long boat Wave Walker. It was made of wood and it weighed 30 tons. It was a beautiful boat and was made with great skill. They spent months in fitting it out. It was tested in the roughest weather they could find. It was to be a 2,55,000 uh, kilometers journey. They had planned to complete it in three years. The first part of the journey was completed pleasantly. They sailed the west coast of Africa and reached Cape Town. And now for the second part of the journey, they were to enter the world's roughest sea. It was the Southern Indian Ocean. Here they took two crewmen or sailors to help them. One was American, Larry Vigil and the other was Swiss, Herb Siegler. It was two days after that they had started from Cape Town. Strong wind began to blow. The wind kept blowing continuously and for the next two weeks. The writer was not worried about the strong winds, but he was worried about the size of the waves. The waves went as high as uh, the main mast of their ship, uh, up to 15 meters. On December uh, 25, they were uh, 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. The weather was terribly bad, but they had a Christmas tree and enjoyed Christmas in a wonderful way. And also they, uh, they enjoyed the New Year Day in a spirited manner and beautiful manner. They hoped that the weather would change soon. It changed, but for the worse. On January 2, there were uh, huge waves. The ship rose to the uh, top of each wave. They had put up only a small uh, sail in, in the front of uh, the ship. The screaming of the uh, sound, the screaming sound of the wind was painful to the ears. In order to slow down the speed, they dropped the storm jib also. They secured everything tightly with the ropes, attached lifelines to their life rafts or life saving boats. Then they put on their oilskins and life jackets. The first indication of impending disaster or the disaster that was coming near uh, came at about 6 p.m. with a deadly silence. The wind uh, dropped and the sky immediately grew dark. And then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud haunted back of the ship. The narrator realized that it was not a cloud but what? It was a wave like no other he had ever seen. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves. 
and a dreadful breaking crest. The roar changed into a thunder. The writer thought that the ship would ride over the wave, but there was a dreadful explosion that shook the deck. Torrent of water broke over the ship. The narrator had smashed into the steering wheel. He was thrown overboard. He was aware, aware that uh, he was uh, sinking below the waves. He accepted his approaching death. He thought that he would die. He was losing consciousness. He felt quite peaceful. Then unexpectedly his head came out of the water. He saw uh, the wave walker a few meters away. It was turning over into the sea. The mast was almost horizontal. Then a wave threw it upright. The narrator's lifeline was still tied to the ship. It pulled at him with such a jerk that he was thrown back onto his ship. Now the waves tossed him uh, around uh, the deck like a rag doll. His left uh, ribs uh, and teeth were broken and his mouth was uh, filled with what uh, with blood uh, somehow he found the steering wheel and tried to control the ship for the next wave there was uh, water everywhere on the ship he could feel that uh, the water had entered the lower parts of the ship but he could uh, he couldn't dare to leave the steering wheel and go down to investigate Suddenly, the door, uh, the door in the deck uh, floor opened and who appeared? His wife appeared. Mary appeared. She said, we are sinking. The lower decks have smashed and there is water everywhere. The narrator asked Mary to take the wheel and he himself went down to see what he could do. Uh, when he went down, he saw Larry and Herb trying to pump out the water. Broken pieces of wood were hanging all around. The right side of the ship had bulged inwards. Clothes, crockery, charts uh, and toys were floating about in the deep water. The writer half swam and half crawled into the uh, children's cabin. Uh, he asked them if they were all right and they answered yes. But Sue said that her head had been hurt a bit. There was a big bump uh, above her eyes. But the narrator had no time to attend to it. He had uh, to plug the hole uh, from where the water was coming in. If it was not done, the ship was sure to sink. Debris was floating uh, around the cabins. It blocked and uh, the, uh, it blocked the hand pumps also. The electric pump was also not working. It had short circuited. The water level in the ship was rising dangerously. Luckily, they had another electric pump. The writer connected it to the outpipe and it started working. It was, uh, he was able to uh, plug uh, in big holes also. The night dragged on. They had to keep pumping and steering all the night. They sent radio signals for the help, but there was no reply. It was not something surprising because they were, they were where? They were in a remote corner of the world. Susan's uh, head had uh, uh, swollen dangerously. Her eyes looked terribly black. She had a deep cut on her arm. Uh, when the writer asked why she had not told of her injuries, uh, she replied that she did not want to worry her father when he was trying to save all of them. But uh, next morning comes now. Uh, by the morning of uh, uh, January 3, the water level was quite under control. Uh, it was 15 hours since uh, the wave had hit the uh, ship, but they had survived. Now he could have two hours rest in rotation, but a lot of repair had to be done in the lower parts of the ship where all the wooden frames were smashed. It seemed impossible that wave walker would be able to reach Australia. The narrator checked his chart. He calculated that there were uh, two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the East. One of them was Isle Amsterdam. Now, uh, their only hope was to uh, reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. But that could be possible only if the wind stopped and uh, they could uh, put up the sail. It was uh, January 4 and they had been pumping water continuously for the last 36 hours. 
Now only a few centimeters of water was left. They could uh, they could put uh, they they couldn't put any sail uh, on the main on the main mast. The pressure could uh, tear apart the damaged ship. So they hoisted only the storm jib and started uh, for where they thought the two islands were. Mary found some meat and biscuits for them. They had their first meal in almost two days. The sense of relief was uh, for a short time. It was short lived. At 4 p.m., black clouds began to build up behind them. The wind began stormy and waves rose higher. The weather continued to get worse throughout the night. By dawn on January 5, the situation was again very horrible. The narrator went in to comfort the children. His son Jonathan asked a very difficult question. Daddy, are we going to die? The writer uh, tried to assure him that uh, they would succeed in uh, their efforts. But uh, in his heart, he felt that it was very difficult, almost impossible. On hearing this, uh, his son replied, Daddy, we are not afraid of dying if we can all be together, you and mommy, Sue and I. The writer could find no words to answer, but he was determined in his heart to fight, uh, to fight the sea with everything he had. That evening, the writer and his wife sat together holding hands. More and more water was getting in through the broken planks. Both of them felt that the end was near. By, by the morning of uh, January 6, wave walker had come out of the storm. The wind had eased. The narrator went in the chart room and made a study of the charts and made other calculations too. Uh, the best he could know was that in 1,50,000 kilometers wide ocean, they were looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. While the narrator and his wife were making calculations, their daughter moved painfully up to, up to him and uh, the left side of forehead was now swollen badly. Her uh, blackened eyes were narrowed to slits. Sue gave uh, the narrator a card she had made. On it, it was written, Oh, how I love you both. So this card is to say, thank you. Let's hope for the best. Beautiful and encouraging words of the daughter. At about 2 p.m., the narrator went on the deck. He asked Larry to steer the ship at 185 degrees. He told him that by following the course, uh, that course, he expected to see the island at about 5 p.m. Then he went down and dozed off in his cabin. But when he got up, it was 6 p.m. And it was growing dark. He was greatly depressed. Again, you know, uh, because they were supposed to reach their, reach their destiny by 5 p.m. But it was 6 p.m. And he was disappointed and thought that they had missed uh, the destination. Just then, his son Jonathan came and Sue was right behind him. Jonathan asked his father, can I have a hug? But the uh, father, the narrator was confused that why his son was asking for a hug. The son said to his father, because you are the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain. With a disappointing heart, the narrator replied, Not today, John. I am afraid. Uh, why he was disappointed? Because he thought that they missed the island. Uh, then Sue uh, informed her father that they had found the island. And in the excitement, with joy, the narrator shouted, What? He was extremely happy. Uh, the narrator ran to the deck. He saw the stark outline of Isle Amsterdam. It was a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation, but the most beautiful island in the world. Dear students, do you know why, why that bleak piece of volcanic became the most beautiful island in the world for them? Because it saved the lives of all these people, uh, the only hope in their desperate uh, situation. This, uh, this was a 65 uh, kilometer long island and it was almost barren. 
They stayed offshore for the night and the next morning, the 28 inhabitants of the island held them ashore. So, this is the end of the story. I hope uh, that you have understood uh, the story and enjoyed also. Kindly watch this video at least twice to understand this chapter fully. Uh, also, you are requested to please uh, subscribe to the channel and also make sure to tap the bell icon so that uh, you don't miss any new video. I'll explain the meanings of the difficult words of this chapter and also uh, the question answers uh, in the next video. Uh, till then, stay safe, stay happy. Thank you so much.